Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I can see there's a few more people joining the webinar, and, and um, I think we will we will start off, and, and people can kind of join us as we're going. So, um, firstly, we, we'd like to say thank you for joining us. Um, today, this webinar is, is to talk about moving to, to Gibraltar from the UK. Um, as a, a very brief introduction, my name is Matt Penfold, um, advisor and director here at Fiducian World, and with me is our managing director, Paul Correa. And then also we, we have Joyce Newman from Century 21 in, in Gibraltar, and, and Joyce, I'll introduce you a, a, a bit more later um, as, as we get through the webinar. So what I wanted to do is, is just give a quick rundown of, of what we're what we're looking to, to cover today. So um, Paul gives a quick introduction to, to Fiduciary Wealth Management shortly, and um, then I will follow it up a, a, a kind of brief introduction about Gibraltar um, for those of you who, who haven't had the pleasure of, of being here before. We'll then follow up and, and cover the UK side. Um, including exits in the UK and the issue of UK domicile. Um, after that, we will talk about the residency options you have here in Gibraltar, um, those amazing tax benefits um, that I'm sure you're all interested in and, and the tax planning opportunities that you have. Um, then we will introduce Joyce, who will talk to us uh, about the Gibraltar property market. Um, Paul will cover some of the agreements with, with UK and Spain and, and, and the treaties. Um, we'll answer a few questions that we commonly come across, um, discuss the, the, the roadmap to becoming a Gibraltar resident, and, and finally we will end on the Q&A session. So you can submit your questions for the webinar, and if you've got some, please do it now. Um, and then we will pick these up at the end and, and answer those for you. So, um, Fiducian Wealth, so, so who are we? So, um, yeah, before we start the webinar, if I can hand over to you, please, Paul, if, if you could just introduce yourself and, and the company. Thank you, Matt. Um, my name is Paul Correa. I started my career in the Inland Revenue in 1984. I transitioned into financial services in 1989, and I've been working in the private banking and wealth management sector for 33 years now, I'm a chartered banker by profession. I co-founded Fiduciary Wealth in 2007 together with my partners, who are the owners of the longest standing band one, band one law firm in Gibraltar, established in 1892. We also happen to be a member firm of MGI Worldwide, which is a top 20 ranked global accountancy network. It was established in 1947 in Surrey and it's, been, it's mushroomed into a network with uh, 10,000 professionals in more than 100 countries, in 460 locations, driving $1, $1 billion in revenue. So we are quite quirky in the sense that we are wealth management practice, but, but, this, but we also have both legal and accountancy roots. Our mission is very simple. It's to possibly shape the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. I'm a great believer in the need to engage in broader dialogue to develop deeper relationships and provide more complete solutions. I am also a strong advocate of the need to offer experts holistic, tailored, and impartial advice which stands the test of time. So I think that pretty much sums who we are. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, but if you can just add a little bit, because a lot of people ask me, okay, what do Fiducia Wealth do different when it comes to servicing clients abroad? Thank you, Matt. That's actually a very good question. I was recently invited to a panel of speakers in London to discuss the financial and lifestyle considerations of moving abroad, and I happen to chair the panel uh, with a direct competitor who was asked to introduce himself, and uh, his message was all about the company's growth. There was an internal focus, uh, but no mention of, of clients whatsoever. And let me say that that's no criticism 
whatsoever, far from it. I think they build a very successful business looking inwardly as opposed to outwardly and good luck to them. But it did make me think about our purpose, our mission and our core values. Um, and we've always had a family office approach to business offering a highly personalized service to each and every client relationship that we have and, and they're all highly valued. Um, and, and to go briefly through our values, Matt, I mean, relationships are at the heart of what we do and we have a long-term focus. So we like to preserve our clients' legacy for their future and for the futures of those that depend on them. We are extremely passionate about possibly shaping the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice. And, you know, lastly, but, but not least, ethics is, is really important to us as a business. And we always do the, the, the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. And our mission is very si simple, um, and it might be a bit simplistic, Matt, but, but uh, we, we want to help expats and, and their families. And, and if I had to sum it in, in a few words, I would say we're all about service, all about helping, all about caring about our clients and supporting them in the best way possible. As I said, it sounds simplistic, perhaps, but that's who we are and what we stand for. And we've been consistent since day one when the offices opened for business 15 years ago. Great. Thank you, Paul. And yeah, it sums us up very nicely, I think. Um, so Gibraltar itself, so um, uh, when I introduced the, the webinar, you know, there, there's a lot of people here and, and some familiar names and, and you may know Gibraltar very well. Um, and then you may not know. Um, so a, a kind of brief introduction for those who don't. So um, Gibraltar is an overseas British territory. It's, it's located at the kind of southern tip of, of the Iberian Peninsula, connected geographically to, to Spain, of, of, of course. And, and it's why a lot of people refer to it as, as the best of both worlds. Um, if you could see our window here, you would see the beautiful sunshine that we get. Um, for many months of, of the year, this beautiful kind of Mediterranean weather and culture that kind of seeps in from, from Spain and, and um, various other countries where people kind of flock from to, to come and live in Gibraltar. But also there's that familiarity with the English law, language and, and, and currency and, and maybe kind of lack of bureaucracy that, that you may get in kind of countries nearby. A huge draw, apart from it being a beautiful location, is, is the multiple tax advantages to, to becoming a Gibraltar resident. And, and we will cover those later, but I, I think one thing important is, is what is a, a Gibraltar resident? So to become an ordinarily resident in Gibraltar, the, the simple evaluation of it, you spend 183 days or more in one year. Uh, you can spend 300 days over three consecutive years. Therefore, you become Gibraltar resident and, and, and tax resident within that. You have to consider other countries, which we, we will cover a little bit shortly. And Gibraltar as, as a jurisdiction is a thriving business center. We have financial services here, of course, tourism, lots of gaming firms here, general trade, we also like to take a, a modern approach, attracting fintech firms, blockchain, crypto, and, and, and DLT. So it's a it's a very thriving community. Uh, a lot of people are drawn to here to collaborate with, with people in those sort of industries. So we touched on a little bit about the, the UK, but so um, yeah, Paul, if you can cover this. So um when somebody is, is leaving in the UK, how do they ensure that their exit is, is, is clean? Okay, again, good question. There are many different factors which need, which um, determines whether you are deemed to be UK tax resident or not. And clearly the number of days that you spend, physically spend in the UK in any given tax year is an important consideration, but it's not the only one. And um, you also need to, think about the pattern of your presence in the UK, your connections with the UK, which could include things like family, property, working life, or social connections. 
and it's the, it is the UK statutory residency test 2013, which allows you to plan the date in which you become non-resident in the UK, and actually determines how much time you can spend in the UK, or how many days you can you can visit the UK once you've exited without accidentally re-triggering residency. It's always advisable if you can to exit the UK at the end of the UK tax year, which, as you all know, is the 5th of April, um, purely because it's cleaner. But as you know, when you exit one country and arrive in another, every country has its own uh, tax years. Gibraltar's tax year runs from 1st of July to 30th of June. So even if you have a clean break in the UK, inevitably it overlaps. Um, as I said, advising it would be our recommendation to opt for a clean tax year if you can. Uh, however, you may decide uh, for a split tax year between the UK and, and Gibraltar, and there are very, three very specific rules where a split year applies in the UK automatically without further guidance being sought. One, when you are starting full-time full employment overseas. Two, when your spouse or partner is seeking full-time employment overseas. Or thirdly, if you cease to have a UK home. Under those conditions, you can have a split tax year without any issues from HMRC. Otherwise, you know, it can become complicated and you should seek appropriate um, UK advice. Okay, thanks, Paul. And, and I guess the other part of exits in the UK and, and something that's sometimes misunderstood or people don't even consider is your UK domicile. So how does that work and, and how does this affect someone's inheritance tax position? Well, the, the, the good news is for those of you who are listening in today and, and thinking and considering uh, relocating to Gibraltar and establishing a, a home here, the good news is there's no inheritance tax in Gibraltar. Unfortunately, there's some bad news that comes with it. Uh, you're likely to remain exposed to UK inheritance tax uh, as, as UK inheritance tax is not based on the concept of tax residency, but rather on domicile. And this is a quirky thing which, which very few countries have, but, but notably UK and Ireland, the inheritance tax is based on this concept of domicile of origin. And this is something you acquire at birth and normally it's taken from your father. Now, whilst you can claim and acquire a domicile of choice by settling in a new country with the intention of living there permanently, uh, I must say that this is always fraught with difficulty, there's no fixed rules, and the burden of proof also always falls on you to prove that you've acquired a new domicile of choice. And there's no particular guidance from HMRC with regard to that point. It's in, my in any event, in my experience, and, um, and probably Matt as well, I don't know, but it's not uncommon for Brits to or, or expatriates to move to Gibraltar and then return to the UK on a temporary basis, perhaps due to ill health, or other times it's following the death of a spouse. Um, and if it's on a temporary basis, even for one year, that kind of re-triggers UK domicile. So even though theoretically, if you look at the tax rules, you can avoid UK inheritance tax after five years of non-residency. I think in practice, it is more complicated than that. And, and, and you know, there's ties like business interests, social and family interest, property ownership, and even your yeah, intentions can result in one being considered a UK domicile for inheritance tax. Even insignificant ties can be challenged and HM, HMRC have been known to rely on the most tenuous of grounds to dismiss claims that one has acquired a domicile of choice. And, and that has consequences. I mean, the most high profile case is that of the Welsh, of the now deceased Welsh actor, Richard Burton. He lived many years in the US before moving to Switzerland in 1957. He then spent 27 years in Geneva in Switzerland, finally passing away in 1984. And uh, 
let me assure you, he received Packer advice, best advice in the market. And, and the UK authorities, unfortunately, made an inheritance tax claim on his estate on the ground that he never actually relinquished his UK domicile, <laughs> notwithstanding the fact that he had left 30 years earlier. And they were quite they were successful in that claim uh, for one reason, intentions. He purchased a burial plot in Wales. So he retained his emotional ties with the country and he always intended to return to the UK. And apparently his request to be buried in a red suit, I guess with a dragon, with a copy of Dylan Thomas poems did not help his case one bit. And you know, I say it with a, with a pinch of salt, but it's true. And as a result of that, his worldwide estate, which at the time was 5 million, was subject to a UK inheritance tax bill of 2.4 million. But as always, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. And the good thing is that being a UK and non-UK tax resident really does provide you with plenty of tax planning opportunities to restructure the assets to either mitigate UK inheritance tax and sometimes to potentially eradicate any liability. And this is where I think a firm like ours can provide perfect advice uh, to address that, you know, flaw in Gibraltar residency because everyone thinks, okay, I'm out of the UK loop for inheritance tax. And sadly, Matt, that, as you know, better than I do that, that's not the case. No, absolutely. And, and it's a good lead on to something that actually we will cover a little bit later. So thanks, for Paul. That's, that's really great. So um, I'd like to talk about the residency options in, in Gibraltar and, and those of you who are planning to move, I'm, I'm sure, want to understand that. Um, but the, the big topic that, that seemingly has gone on for, for what seems like forever has, has been Brexit and, and it still kind of lingers over us. So, um, Paul, maybe your best place to tell us um, uh, what sort of impact has, has Brexit had on, on Brits planning to move to, to Gibraltar? Yeah, um, well, I mean, uh, you're talking about the post Brexit reality. Right? Exactly, oh, yeah, yeah. Fine. Uh, well, Gibraltar residency on a self sufficiency basis is temporarily on hold. It was, it was born out of it's an EU approved scheme, right? Um, and since we Brexited with the UK, that scheme is now temporarily on, on hold. Um, application from EU nationals looking to establish residency, residency locally have been suspended. Unfortunately, and you know, not that I agree with this, but this extends to British nationals too, who have no material connection to Gibraltar and who require civil registration cards and permits of residence in Jimmy. Unfortunately, under the current provisions of the Immigration uh, Asylum and Refugee Act, British citizens continue to be treated as EU nationals um, for the purposes of, of self-sufficiency. Because when, when that act was enacted, you know, born out of the EU, you know, there was no distinction between EU nationals and UK nationals. And, um, we are being told by the ministry that the authorities are looking to address that issue soon. Uh, unfortunately, soon is not fast enough and it still hasn't been addressed and I'm confident that they will. In the meantime, we're still able to process applications from British nationals who have... Uh, so there's two existing loopholes which allow you to, to establish residency and the self-sufficiency unaffected by, by this act. One of them is if you transfer your state uh, pensions from the UK to Gibraltar, with that transferring your medical rights as well, which are passed to the Gibraltar Health Authority. And the second instance where we can circumvent this blockage is if you have UK business interests and you register yourself as self-employed, or you seek employment locally. So that there are some reports, but it's not as clear as it was before, even though, you know, within a reasonable time frame, I think this, this issue will be addressed. I, I think so, Paul. And just a, a, a point on that. So transferring the state benefits 
So somebody needs to be already in receipt of their state pension in the UK, is that right? Correct. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so we will cover the, the residency options and, and Paul's kindly led me into self-sufficiency. So we're in this, this position where there are people very keen to, to move here and, and they're being held back. Although, as Paul rightly says, we, we expect that to be unblocked as, as talks are ongoing. Uh, but there is still opportunities for those um, who can transfer their, their pension to, to Gibraltar or who are employment or self-employment. So self-sufficiency. So, I mean, the, the link kind of gives it away a little bit there. Um, to achieve self-sufficiency status, you need to be able to evidence that um, you have sufficient financial means to, to support yourself and your family. As, as part of that, you, you need evidence of, of accommodation in, in Gibraltar and private medical cover. Um, again, with the medical cover, you, you do need that to gain residency, but it is possible to transfer your UK NHS rights to Gibraltar after you've secured residency. Now, the beauty of self-sufficiency is, it's entirely possible that an individual could live here and, and pay 0% tax if they're living on um, things like that, their investments, um, rental income from the UK, which of course continues to be um, taxed in the UK, but zero tax in, in Gibraltar. And then their pension income, which can, um, can benefit from a very special rate of 2.5% tax in Gibraltar. Um, that's if you transfer your UK pensions to, to Gibraltar, which we'll be able to cover uh, very shortly for you. So I'll move on to the next um, residency category, which is category two, a, a CAT two, which is um, commonly known as. So it's a, a special kind of scheme that's, that's been generated to attract wealthy individuals to, to Gibraltar. One of the conditions being that you need a net worth of a minimum of, of two million pounds, and you need special approval by the Gibraltar Finance Finance Director to, to be able to qualify on the CAT two. Now, the, the, the huge draw of the CAT two is the amount of tax you you pay is is limited. So to qualify for the CAT two, you, you need to be generating earned income greater than 160k per year. Um, which leads to a, a minimum tax sum of 32k, but the maximum that we would pay is a very attractive um, 37,310 per year. So it's, it really kind of limits the, the tax you pay on that amount if, if you can consider the equivalent tax rate and, and tax paid in, in the UK then there's a huge saving to, to be made then. A few conditions and, and similar ones with self-sufficiency in, in the sense that you need suitable um, accommodation. The difference being with the CAT2 is, is that the accommodation needs to be approved by the Gibraltar Finance Centre. Joyce, who's joining us today, will, will know more about that than I, but there's certain categories of, of property that qualify um, as, as the CAT status and you cannot have been tax resident in, in Gibraltar during the five years previously. So what that tells us is that you can move from CAT2 to, to self-sufficiency, but you can't move from self-sufficiency to, to CAT2. So it's very important for those considering moving to Gibraltar to, to really consider which um, residency scheme suits them the, the best. Um, because it's not just about the kind of immediate future, it's, it's about their plans as, as they continue to, to live in Gibraltar. <coughs> um, there are certain few other conditions that, that come with that, which of course, you know, we, we can speak to, to individuals on a personal basis if, if they are considering the cat so. And, and then the final one that I wanted to talk about is the high executives possessing special skills, uh, the HEPs. So this is an employment-based scheme for those earning 160K or more. Um, so this is for individuals who have been working outside of Gibraltar and, and secure um, employment in Gibraltar. The condition means their salary needs to be above that level. They cannot have been tax residents in, in Gibraltar three years immediately. So again, you, you can't go from 
uh, the normal employment up to the HEPs, and you need to live in Gibraltar and, and have a qualifying property. Now, the HEPs is, is a special scheme which, um, similar to, to CAP2, limits the amount of, of tax you will pay, um, which CAPs are offered 39,940. Um, you can also qualify for residency via self-employed, which Paul touched on uh, uh, employment as, as well. Um, and this kind of leads me on to, to the tax benefits of, of Gibraltar. So we'd cover income tax first. And as you may be aware of, well, income tax is, is very generous, but also rather unique in Gibraltar. Um, because in, in most countries, the, the UK um, being one of them, tax works on a progressive tax scale. The more you earn, the higher tax you pay on a percentage basis and, and you go up the, the various bands. Gibraltar does not work like that. It works on what they call a, a bell curve tax rate. So as you earn more and more, you reach the, the peak and then the actual rate of tax you pay reduces down. So, so the peak is at um, 28% and then it reduces back down, gradually down to um, 5% um, towards the very end. So that generates an effective tax rate that will never be above 25%. So very attractive from the income tax. Then we look at all the other benefits. So no VAT, no wealth tax, no capital gains tax, no savings or gifts tax. Corporation tax in Gibraltar, previously 10%, now still only 12.5%, which is much lower than European counterparts and, and, and the UK. And a very interesting one is, is dividends from your UK company. Now, it, it, it's certain caveats, and again, this is where we'd like to have individual conversations with people, but it's entirely possible to, to draw dividends from your UK company without taxing both the UK and in, in, in Gibraltar. And then finally, we, we talk about no capital gains tax, which is great in, in, in Gibraltar. Um, one consideration you need to take into account is, okay, you relocated from the UK, um, you've avoided capital gains tax in the UK, there's no capital gains tax in, in Gibraltar, but you can't then just immediately return to, to the UK. I'm sure if it was that simple, everyone would be doing it. So the, the guidelines or the rules are that you have to be outside of the UK for a minimum of, of six years, um, and then it's nice, clean break, no capital gains. The exception to that is, is UK property and land, which, because it's situated in the UK, you continue to pay UK um, capital gains on that. Just two points of that, yes, uh, yes. Yeah, what, what you've covered. Just, just to um, qualify that statement, about no dividends being paid and on, on or, or no tax being paid on UK dividends. Um, and the reason for that is that there's a double taxation agreement between Gibraltar and the UK. And when it comes to taxing rights, the UK won't tax you if you have a double taxation agreement. Yes. And Gibraltar doesn't tax you either. So it's quite unusual and potentially the UK will turn around and tax. But it's highly unlikely. The, the reality is that you end up receiving a UK dividend from a UK company and paying no tax whatsoever. And if I may, may just go back a few slides concerning category two, yeah. because this is something which really I find uh, annoying. And I think you know, I hear it time and time again from practitioners locally who go around saying, Catch is brilliant because you don't have to spend a single day. Well, well, that's absolutely true. That's what it says on the CAN. You know, you can establish tax residency on a capture basis without spending more than a day. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But what they don't tell you is that to establish your yeah, tax residence here on an ordinary basis, as Matt refers to earlier, you have to spend at least 100 days. And even if you were to spend 100 days, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you could actually trigger tax residency in Spain or the UK or elsewhere because each country has its own set specific rules concerning tax residency. So what you don't want to do is to come here and, and register as a tax resident on a capital basis and think that you know, you're know you insulated and protected from being challenged by a third country. You're not. And I think it's 
in my view, responsible to go around saying, come here and be a cat too, and you know, for a day that solves your problem, it doesn't. Not from a tax perspective, it doesn't. And I think when it comes to tax planning, uh, it's really important that these things are, are discussed properly and, and considered. No, Paul, it's, it's a very good point. And, and I, yeah, I think I've lost track of the number of people who have who've asked me, oh, can I move to Gibraltar, but not actually live there? And, but, but you know, X, X person told me we can. Well, of course, it, it just doesn't make sense. And, and Gibraltar is an incredible tax environment, but, but to just register yourself and not be there, it, it doesn't make sense. Hence, it, it's, it's not feasible. Um, so Paul, I really appreciate you adding that. That's, that's very helpful. Um, so we talked about the, the tax benefits and, and one we touched on earlier was um, the pension income. So we, we, we work all our lives, we, we build up our, our pensions, um, we, we look forward to retirement and, and there are main source of, of income. Um, and Gibraltar is, is incredibly unique in, in, in this instance in that you can transfer your pension, your UK pension to a Gibraltar pension. Um, then there's, there's no overseas ta tax charge for, for doing so, as, as long as the pension is uh, a qualifying um, pension within Gibraltar and, and it meets the HMRC status. And, and you can benefit from 2.5% income tax on your pensions, tax at source, and, 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 and no more as long as you are a Gibraltar resident. Um, so to do this, you, you can transfer to what is called a, a QROPS, which is a qualifying recognized overseas pension scheme. So you have that incredible benefit of, of reduction in income tax on, on your pension, but there's a little bit more to it and, and, and even more benefits. So for those who, who have built up their pension and are close to the lifetime allowance, which currently stands up just over 1 million, um, if you breach that limit, there, there is a 25% tax charge on income or even 55% on, on lump sums. If you are close to that limit and, and you transfer your pension to a, to a QOPS in Gibraltar, it's, um, it creates what, it, what is called a benefit crystallization event. So they assess the value of your pension. If you're under that lifetime allowance, then there is no, um, no tax paid. And then your, your pension can continue to grow over and above that. But because you already had the, the seismic tested as it transfers, there's no further tax to pay. So it's great for those individuals who are close to that limit as, as well. Um, another benefit of, of that is, is in the UK, if you die um, age 75 or above, then your beneficiaries will inherit your pension, but they will pay tax on the income at their marginal tax rates. The QR tools dictate that regardless of, of what age you, 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 um, you pass away, there will be no tax liability on, on the beneficiaries. And so we talked to a, a, a more accurate poll talked earlier about the issue of UK domicile and, and um, you retain that and exposure to new UK IHT. But the beauty of, of being resident in Gibraltar is it opens up these planning opportunities for you. And, and, um, a very useful one is a Gibraltar QOPS. Very similar to a QOPS, um, sometimes referred to as a, the sister product, but um, stands for the Qualifying Non UK Pension Scheme. Now, the big difference between the two is, is a QOPS is, is funded via um, contribution built up over time and then from your UK pension, which is then transferred to a QOPS. A QOPS is funded from a lump sum investment. Now, you may think, okay, there's, there's no capital gains in, in Gibraltar, so why would I use a QNOPS rather than just, just invest my sum? Well, a, a key um, part of a QNOPS is because it is a pension scheme, if you place the money in a QNOPS, it's immediately outside of your estate for UK IHT. And that's even if you return to the UK. So there are key conditions. A, a QNOPS must be set up as a genuine retirement vehicle, it, it needs to be in line with your wealth, age, and, and future in, income requirements. Um, what we mean by that is if, if somebody has net assets of, say, £2 million, and they put £2 million in the QNOPS, 
that's clearly not a, a retirement scheme. That's clearly used purely for the inheritance tax avoidance and, and HMRC would challenge that. Um, but that individual can put a proportion of their wealth into a QNORPS and immediately outside of your state for, for UK IHT. So a QNORPS is a very, very useful vehicle that can be used um, for, for that planning. So um, it takes us on to, to part three. Um, and this is where we'd like to bring in our guest speaker, um, Joyce. So Joyce, I will just introduce you first and, and unmute you as well. If you can do so. So um, while you're doing that, Joyce, I, I will make a, a quick introduction. So Joyce here is the Managing Director and owner of Cent Century 21 here in Gibraltar. Um, she purchased the Gibraltar fin franchise over 10 years ago. Formerly in corporate finance, Joyce built and sold a number of businesses over the years and, and has huge experience in property development and, and, and finance. Highly qualified as a, as a board director as well and, and a wealth of knowledge really helps contribute to business expansion, property portfolio and, and investment strategy. So um, Joyce, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you can just please start and, and tell us a bit about the Gibraltar property market, what can people expect here? Okay, so thank you everybody um, and welcome. Um, sorry for my throat's croaking, I'm at home, I'm under quarantine with COVID, so I'm just at the end of it, so I get free tomorrow. Um, so just to give you a little overview of um, the sort of properties in and areas in Gibraltar. Gibraltar is divided up into seven districts ultimately, and in each district, each has its own, um, if you like, little speciality of what's nice. So for example, if you wanted to live in the South District, you're away from town, um, free buses would get you there backwards and forwards. You're outside of what we call the Levanta that hangs over the rock. And, um, and you're kind of living in the sun with great views over Africa. So that would be one speciality. And then on the other hand, there's those who don't want to um, pop on a bus or get taxis or drive. So in which case, living near a town, you've got various marinas, um, Queensway Quay, Ocean Village. Um, these are all very much um, walking distance and uh, very near the commercial areas as well. If you're moving here to work um, in the World Trade Center, for example, Ocean Village would be the nearest, so you literally are full out of work, into home, and then into the bars and restaurants, which are all around the marina. So um, I can go through the seven if anyone wants particular help in understanding them. Very happy to, to you know, anyone who does relocate out, we tend to drive them around, show them the different areas and, and sort of shortlist down to preferred options. Um, looking at the type of um, property you need, well, as... Um, as Paul and Matthew have explained, is very much linked to why you're coming and how you're setting up your tax residency here. So CAT 2 would tend to need to be a, um, if you like, a, a, a well-to-do residence. So that means it would need to be more than 60 square metres. It was 50, but I think it's um, it needs to be 60 to be absolutely sure. It needs to be in one of the resort type locations. So i.e. it would be around swimming pools and complexes and have gyms. So it's a, a much more luxury type apartment. So those areas would be places like Queensway Quay, like Ocean Village and Midtown, um, for example. Um, so HEPs as well have restricted properties. It has to be a HEPs type property. So again, we can guide you there. And you may also see, if you look on our website um, at our properties, we have what's called three-year residency. So when you're relocating to Gibraltar, you wouldn't qualify um, to be able to buy any of these. And certainly none of these would be rented because one of the restrictions, they're, they're, they were released to allow um, local Gibraltarians to be able to buy these properties. So therefore they came with restrictions that you can't rent them out. So after three years of living here, you could buy one of these. They tend to be at least 30% cheaper than normal properties. However, you wouldn't be able to rent it out if you decided to go off and relocate elsewhere, whether temporary or permanent. Um, so other than that, um, once you've chosen your area, we, um, we do both rentals and sales. Most people tend to come and rent. Um, they would start off with one year, get to learn the area, get to learn where they like and what they want to buy and then move to buy. Obviously we'll also guide if you're looking to buy an investment portfolio, we property manage so we can take all that stress away from you. 
And, um, and then other than that, um, as an agency, we also um, give you advice, particularly if you're setting up a business, you're looking for the right business location. Uh, as Paula Matthew said, I've got a lot of background experience in, in corporate finance and lending, et cetera. So um, able to guide you as to who to talk to, where to get finance, how to set up the company and where to find offices and what, you know, looking at what business you're doing, what the best type of property you would need for your commercial business. Um, and that I think is probably enough at the moment to give you an overview of Gibraltar. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Um, Joyce, if you don't mind, just a couple of quick questions. Um, one thing we, we've noticed is property prices have, have increased quite rapidly of late. What has caused this? Um, yes, no, that's absolutely, absolutely correct. I guess at the end of the day, we're only a small rock and we're running out of space. So we can't build properties uh, fast enough in order to um, supply the demand. Um, so apart from the fact there's not enough stock, we're also in a situation where um, we, you know, we survived COVID extremely well. So we're a great destination where people want to come. Um, obviously coming out of Brexit, if you want to be here, very local, easy to get into Europe. Um, the tax incentives are, are great and getting better and better. Um, and there's been some changes to Spanish tax with us um, coming out of Europe. So as well, that's um, led to a lot of uncertainty. So people the more want to move into Gibraltar to be sure that, um, you know, their interests, they're looking after their best interests. As well, on top of that, you know, we look after, you know, most of the major gaming companies, their head offices are here from around the world, and they too have seen an absolute boom. And as you know, cryptocurrency has seen a boom. So there are a lot of jobs wanted, a lot of demand, a lot of people coming. And, you know, it's just literally, we're running out of properties to rent. We have some new, a lot of developments happening. We've got about, um, we've got three or four developments that are literally due for release this year. Um, so once they're out, those that are been bought to let, they'll be available for renting. So we'll see some more stock. So we might see a little bit of sorting out in the prices, but by and large, at the end of the day, we own, you know, we can't build fast enough. Um, there's more developments coming. There's probably about seven or eight major developments that are coming through planning. So I think over the next two or three years, we'll start to see things ease more and more. But right now, I think, um, you know, definitely these prices have rapidly gone up, particularly in the last uh, last six months. And I think at the moment they're probably leveling off because there's a little, everybody's kind of waiting for Brexit um, and not wanting to sell. You know, everything that's available is rented. Um, it's just about finding the right property. So if you do find a property that you like, I would highly recommend that you just don't hesitate. You have to jump on the bandwagon and grab it because they're going super fast, particularly on the rentals front. So doing video viewings, if you can't get here, you know, it is just making a leap of faith basically and trusting the, um, you know, the agent when he's showing you and walking you around that you've chosen the right property. Um, so hopefully things will ease though in the next few, I guess the next six months or towards the end of the year when we see um, Forbes, um, Eurocity, they're all coming out with the new development, so we should see more properties on the market. Great, thank you, Joyce. That's very informative. We really appreciate that. So um, we'll move on to, to the next stage, and, and um, I guess politically, and, and Joyce, you actually touched on that briefly then, is, is um, there's always been uh, certain issues between Gibraltar and Spain. We, we've all kind of read about it in, in the past, but there has been a recent tax agreement between Gibraltar and, and, and Spain, Paul. So what are the implications of this? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I did notice that Joyce quite rightly touched on this tax agreement. Some people would claim that it's a political agreement because it doesn't follow the OECD model of double taxation agreements. There's political undertones in, 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 in the way it's been structured. And some even claim that it would, you know, if it was contested in court, it would, it would, um, it would be rejected. But leaving that aside, we've done webinars in the past to cover the tax agreement, and it's probably outside the scope of this webinar to go into the detail and minutia of the implications. But, but, but in terms of Gibraltar, Spain, just a few practical pointers. Um, Non-Spanish 
tax residents in Spain who are looking to establish residency in Gibraltar, they would have had to do so before 31st of December 2021 to avoid being captured by the agreement and I'll explain why. I mean, the rules regarding the retention of Spanish tax residency for non-Spanish nationals is covered under Article 21.2.C of the international agreement with Spain, but thankfully it is prospective rather than retrospective in nature. Uh, they apply to future taxable periods starting after the international agreement was entered into force. So it means it didn't apply from the date in which the agreement was signed in 2019. It did for Spanish tax residents, uh, for Spanish nationals, but not for Brits and other EU nationals. But under this Article 2.1c, non <laughs> Spanish nationals that spend at least one complete tax year in Spain from this from this day on, meaning from 1st of January 2022, and then change their residency from Spain to Gib, would retain Spanish residency uh, in the year in which the change was made, and then in the four subsequent tax years thereafter, which is quite unusual because Spain has a tax agreement with Andorra. And again, you know, our tax agreement is peculiar because it doesn't follow this OECD model. It's quite odd that they can, you know, that someone can exit Spain and still be deemed Spanish tax resident. So it remains to be seen whether it's a challenge at some point in the future because <clears throat> in all probability that particular course might, might fall by the wayside. But as things stand now, um, you know, the, the, if you are a tax resident in Spain and haven't been in so for more than a year, <coughs> and you really ought to make sure that you exit Spain quickly and become tax resident in Gibraltar. Equally, if you are thinking of moving to the Iberian Peninsula and you are undecided between establishing tax residency in Spain and Gibraltar, please bear in mind that if you decide to establish tax residency in Spain, you're not closing the door, but you're opening yourself up to a potential tax liability for a further five years. So um, you have to be very mindful of those, um, yeah, those little traps. <coughs> you know, really, um, they can really uh, destroy all the tax planning that you do. Yeah, so, okay, well, we'll stay on the political path <laughs> um, a little bit, Paul. Um, because I know, of course, post-Brexit, there's, there's been talks between the UK, Gibraltar, EU, and, and Spain would be involved on, on a future post-Brexit treaty. So can you just update us there, please, Paul? Yeah, they, they, you know, the, the UK, Jim side, and so I would say UK, Jim, and together with them, they agreed a political agreement in the last minutes of the last hour of Brexit, um, in you know December 2020, they entered into the political agreement subject to a treaty, subject to um, the EU uh, approval and the EU having a, a mandate agreed by all 27 countries. Um, and right now, uh, the government of Gibraltar, together with the UK, are locked in a process of negotiation uh, with the Spanish and EU um, sides. Um, uh, and, and it's in relation to Gibraltar's future post-Brexit relationship with Spain and the EU. Everyone wants to ensure fluidity of goods and services at that border. Um, the idea is, and, and you know, these negotiations have been, um, not a lot of information has been disclosed, <coughs> very private and confidential, which one can understand. Um, but what we hear is that one of the ideas that is being mooted is the possibility that Gibraltar joins Schengen and become part of the free travel zone. Apparently, apparently, one of the major sticking points in the negotiations is the fact that the EU mandate talks about Spanish officers performing border controls at all Gibraltar entry points, ports, airports, land border, uh, without mentioning the, the presence of the European agency Frontex guards. 
uh, which formed the basis of the political agreement. And that's really a no-no locally. Um, and then, but more worryingly, the EU have recently introduced the fact that you know the Spanish authorities would be responsible for the issuing of visas for entry and stay in Gibraltar, which is which is which is clearly a non-starter. Because then you know, as they've done with Northern Ireland and, and the protocol there, they start introducing political elements to what is a just a a day-to-day, -day, you know, to ensure that there's that the economies can thrive on both sides of the border, that that's you know that that people can work together more freely, but they start introducing elements which have political undertones. And, and of course that that um, anything that seeks to undermine British sovereignty is non-negotiable. And even though progress has been made with the treaty, uh, it won't be signed that these differences are as a result to the satisfaction of all the parties. If the treaty is signed, then um, I, I would say one other thing, one other thing which is totally unacceptable, um, which has been raised, I think, only yesterday. The British delegation, the Gibraltar delegation, and the British delegation, I think the Gibraltar chief minister, Fabian Picardo, met up with Liz Truss, and one of the issues came, came up, which I'm not surprised about, is, you know, British nationals establishing residency here, uh, uh, I mean, George would know, I should, I think, with a blue card rather than a red card. And Spain quite recently, during this period, decided that, you know, British nationals were not Gibraltar nationals. Um, when they cross that border, their passports get stamped. And more recently, some have been asked whether they intend to spend time in Spain, and then you have to demonstrate that you carry a hand you was with you on a daily basis and you have that accommodation is absolutely ridiculous. And of course, that has been discussed late last night with the UK Foreign Secretary, and I'm sure the British, you know, forget about the Gibraltar side, but, but, but the British side would not allow that uh, because it, it's, you know, treating uh, British nationals deciding to relocate here as third class citizens, which is, which is unacceptable. So if a treaty is signed, then whoever is tax resident here would be conferred, conferred the right to travel within the EU visa-free. But more importantly, it reinstates the post-Brexit, uh, or sorry, the pre-Brexit position of being able to stay in, in Shane, the Schengen country for 180 consecutive days. As you probably all know, as we Brexited, you know, we are only allowed now as third country nationals to spend 90 days every 180 unless you have a golden visa or a non-lucrative visa or whatever else you, you need. So it's quite interesting. I think things are moving quickly and fast. I think there's good intentions on all sides, but there's some political issues that if they don't get resolved, there will be no treaty. And then, yes, Gibraltar will, will, will face some challenges, but so will those 15,000 cross-border workers that come to Gibraltar every day from Spain. So I think for that reason and that reason alone, I think it's in everyone's interest that we can create some shared prosperity where everyone wins and a bit of common sense prevails. So that really would be, in my humble opinion, that I think it would be a boom for Gibraltar in terms of it gives it some economic uh, stability again, some clarity, in terms of how things are going to work and, and the ability, you know, we would have probably more border fluidity now than we had when we were ironically part of the EU. So I think that could be tremendous in terms of, of, of the growth, not just for, for Gibraltar, but the surrounding area as well. No, I think I think the stability will help. And, and I think sometimes it's, it's forgotten that we talk about the Gibraltar side, but Spain, there's, there's the 15,000 people, you said, come across the border, Spanish nationals every day to, to work here. So the, the border towns, La Linea and, and Perva Field, they rely on Gibraltar to, 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 for that employment. So there, there's motivation on, on both sides. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting how that plays out, I think. Good. Um, so we, we just, we're getting towards the end. Um, what we're covering just a, a few frequently asked questions. So I think um, we've got a small list there. These are 
questions that we come across quite quite often and, and you know are pretty simple. So what do we have there for? Matt, I have two questions for you. Okay. One at a time. Can I can I be tax resident in Gibraltar and live in Spain? Okay, so we we covered that one a, a little bit at the start, but it's always worth reiterating. The answer is no. Um, if you want to become tax resident in Gibraltar, then you have to spend the time here. If you and, and there's two issues there. You wouldn't be spending enough time in Gibraltar, but also you'd be spending your time in, in Spain. You trigger tax residency there and you'd have your tax obligations in, in Spain. So a simple answer. Okay, and what if my family live in Spain and I am living in Gibraltar? Is that is that doable? Well, that's an interesting one. And, and we come across people who say, okay, I'll get a, a, a small flat here. I'll live here in the week and, and then my family have a a large house in, in Marbella, a Sota Grande, the kids go to, to school there, but, but I will spend enough days in, in, in the flat. And although they are ticking that box, the days, there is a second measurement and, and, and it's classed as where you spend, where you have the center of vital and economic interest. And in that scenario I've described, I, I think the Spanish tax authorities and the Gibraltarians would, would look at that and say, your children are there, your wife is there, her husband, your main residence is there because of the size. You are clearly living in Spain, even if you're spending more time in Gibraltar. And can I add something to that? I think, yeah. I think you've summed it up very well. But the tax agreement that I mentioned earlier yes. does cover that point. Absolutely. And, and there's full cooperation between the tax authorities on both sides, which goes beyond common reporting standards. So there's no escaping from that one because, you know, they provide much more than under common reporting standards in terms of the sharing yeah. of this information. Yeah, I, I think you could argue many, many years ago, somebody may get away with that, but, but now it's, I would say, it's near impossible, really. There's, there's the information shared, as, as Paul Riley says, so it's very unlikely to a, a, a really zero chance of, of that working for you. My final question, let is Gibraltar residency only available for British nationals? No, no, absolutely not. Um, today's webinar is, is, is focused on, on UK nationals look, looking to, well, actually, the, the webinar is, is people moving from the UK to Gibraltar. So we may have individuals here today who, who are UK nationals currently living in the UK, but, but of course, other nationals and, and you will know, Paul, the, the, the variety of, of different nationalities here is, is probably one of the most attractive things about Gibraltar, the, the different cultures and, and different um, backgrounds. So, no, it's, it's available for, for anyone and, and we're happy to discuss that with, with, with anyone who's interested in, in moving to Gibraltar. Um, so, Paul, thanks for the questions and, and I think it's only fair if I ask you one back. Um, which I think is the most important one. Is that payback? This, this is my, this is what, what they like to call revenge. So Paul, what is one piece of advice you would give to anyone looking to relocate to Gibraltar? Well, I think, um, um, yeah, I, I can answer that question. I think it's one piece of advice, but, but it's, it's, uh, it covers different, it covers it from different angles. I think, you know, it's always a bumpy ride when you exit one country to another. Uh, you need a trusted advisor by your side that can hold your hand and make the journey easier for you, ensuring a smooth and seamless transition to your new country of residence. I think that failing to plan is really planning to fail. You, you really need a timeline, you need a strategy, and you need an advisor that can help you execute that strategy. And if you miss key steps along the way, uh, and if you're not properly advised, then, then potentially there could be costly and far-reaching tax consequences. Um, I always advise our clients who engage our services for residency to plan first and to move later, uh, because the planning begins before you exit. And you know, and strategy is important. And, and I always tell clients. Uh, so that they can retain this, <clears throat> that it's okay to be the tortoise, right? There's no need to be the hare. This is not a race. It needs to be executed correctly. Um, so the speed is not crucial, but doing it correctly is. 
And um, if, if, if I may, uh, I'll go back to the issue of UK inheritance tax, uh, because I think it's such a key issue. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to UK inheritance tax, it's always advisable to plan for the worst. Assume you're going to be liable and hope for the best. So, in the event that there's a negative posthumous determination by HMRC, it doesn't reduce the inheritance of your children. We've already seen, given you a, a, a real life case of Richard Burton. You honestly have to plan for UK inheritance. That's, that would be my, my, no, my final comment. Two, two pieces of advice there, Paul, so a two for one special there. So thank you very much. And, and I, I wasn't sure of your answer there, but you teed up nicely here because we, we talk about planning a lot and, and maybe we repeat ourselves, but it's, it's so crucial to plan in advance, um, plan in a, a, a sequential order, follow a timeline. I think uh, the, the words you used, Paul, were. Um, so we developed the, the roadmap, which is what we recommend people follow. So I'll just go through this, this very briefly, but really you need to be starting by gathering all your information and, and then review this information. Then you need to discuss, right, what are your fears, pain points and concerns, <coughs> what concerns you with your relocation, and, and then you can understand your needs and, and what you require from that. Then you really need to identify, right, your future sources of income and, and how this may be taxed, and consider the time you're spending, are you going to spend in various countries? We talked about returning to the UK, maybe people spend time in Spain or even a, a, an extra country. So evaluate the, the viability of what you want to do and, and consider the UK exit strategy, review and consider the UK statutory residency test, because again, this will, will kind of spell out the, the time that you can return to the UK, discuss UK domicile and, and any liability to, to UK inheritance tax. We reiterate that one because unfortunately, you're not gonna move and, and just, just lose that. So that planning is really key there. And, and, identify these UK IHT mitigation techniques and, and um, products that we covered some of them, them before. Consider the residency options available, review these, understand how they suit you and, and understand how these feed into the tax planning opportunity. Then you're in a position to clarify the process and, and source a qualifying property with Joyce's help of, of, of course and then secure mortgage finance if, if that's needed. Um, then you're in a position to address your healthcare requirements, um, including private medical insurance that you may need for your residency application. And there you are, you're, you're ready to apply for your residency. And then you just need to consider the impact of the change of residency on your assets, liabilities, make sure your tax position is optimized, make sure everything is structured correctly, Again, to take into account the, the UK or the country you're exiting and Gibraltar. And then you're in a position, you can do a full re review of your pensions, savings, investments, make sure they're covered from a, a performance point of view, a taxation point of view, but also your protection policies, because it's important to ensure these, these give um, continuity of, of cover because you may have policies in the UK or where you are now that, that, that don't cover you in Gibraltar. So very key and um, something that's very overlooked by people that they, they just presume or, or it's, it's not a priority. But um, as, as Paul kind of rightly says, it's the sort of relocate, uh, relocation is the sort of thing that, that you only do once. So why rush into these things? Why, why be the hare and, and um, make a mistake, whereas you can be the tortoise, do it properly, and, and then, of course, enjoy this beautiful place and, 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 and your lifestyle. Um, so, wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for listening. We've opened it up to, to questions, and, and I can see we've, we've got some there. So let me just access these, and, and we... Um, okay, so we've got a first question from John, which is, how often does Spain close the border? I think mean, you're saying, John. So well, then they don't. Yeah. Yeah, simple as that. I, I think um, because, as you may tell from my accent, I'm originally from the UK and, and 
I, I think sometimes you hear these stories that, okay, they're closing the border, they're doing this again, but no, they don't. It's, it's an open border and, and they have no authority to close it. Um, so another question from, from John, um, and I bring Joyce in to, to answer this one, if you don't mind, Joyce. So it's, um, are flats available for rent? So Joyce, please unmute yourself, and, and if you don't mind answering this one. Joyce, you're on mute. So the answer to that question, yes, there are still plenty of flats to rent. It's just getting the right um, property. What's hard to find are two bedroom sort of luxury apartments. Um, they're kind of all snapped up, but certainly studios, one bedrooms, plenty. there's plenty to rent. So the answer is yes. Okay, thank you, Joyce. And, and another question from John, um, you're getting the impression that only rich people can obtain Gibraltar residency. Is, is that right? Well, I mean, it, it depends how you define rich, right? Yeah. <coughs> I think it depends on your net worth and, and you know, and your disposable income, and that will determine the viability of, of establishing residency. It is certainly true that property prices continue to go up, and that means, uh, as, a, as a consequence of that, it means that, that, that uh, people with, with more with a higher net worth are being attracted to the jurisdiction and it, it may restrict or close the doors to others. But, but you know, rich is a very ambiguous term. Um, if John has any, any interest, he can always reach out and, and we can assess whether his application will be successful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've got a question there. Um, I mean, is that how long to, to get a red, red card and what are the advantages? I think we would have to deal with that separately uh, because um, I don't think it's a question that we can answer no. because it's outside our control. But we can find out for, for this gentleman. Okay, and we, we've got a few more questions here. Um, so the first question is, if I don't transfer a UK SIP to Gibraltar pension scheme and continue my SIP pension drawdown, how is it going to be taxed if I'm a Gibraltar resident? Um, so you would benefit from the special um, two and a half percent on, on tax, so it would form part of your income tax. So we're looking at 25 percent. Okay, and we've got the next questions. Okay, is there any property type restrictions on self-sufficiency um, residency, um, which I believe they're not. No, CATU and, and HEPs are restrictions. Um, Joyce has kindly um, indicated that that's not, not the case. So no, um, I, I think the only caveat in, in there is, is the properties that Joyce um, explained before that are only available to, to, to locals that have that discount, but the general <coughs> property market, no restrictions on, on self-sufficiency. Is Gibraltar in Schengen? As I, as I mentioned before, Gibraltar is not in Schengen, but they are negotiating a treaty as we speak. And if that treaty is ratified and becomes law, then there's every possibility, even though we are not privy to those discussions, the rumor mills tell us that the, the plan is to, for Gibraltar to join, join the Schengen area. Um, so um, I'm sure that within the next few weeks we will have uh, some clarity regarding that point. Okay, thank you. And um, final question there from Andrew: How many days um, can I spend in Spain without picking up any tax liability? Um, so I think we, we we covered that one earlier. Um, a, a very kind of simplistic is is a one eighty three days, but it's not as simple as that. Um, and when people are talking about Chilean tax residency, it's, it's not just that country, but where they're spending the majority of their time, where is, is their vital and economic interest, which we covered before. Um, so they would be expecting you, you to be spending the majority of your time in, in Gibraltar. As it stands as well, we, we've, um, um, <coughs> the post-Brexit, we should be limited to spending 90 in 180 days in, in Spain anyway. So effectively, Andrew, that, that would be your limit as, as it stands. Okay, well, um, 
I, I think that covers all the questions we've, we've got on there. So um, I, I just want to finish by thank you everyone for attending. Really appreciate you taking your time. We hope it's been informative. Um, our contact details there, should you wish, wish to contact us. Likewise, if you want to speak to Joyce, please contact us or, or go to their website, Century 21 Gibraltar. Joyce, thank you so much for, for joining us today. That was um, really interesting to hear, so really appreciate that. And, and yeah, thank you everyone. And, and yeah, have a wonderful rest of the day.